some, uh, I see Ms. Cooper. What does it take? Yeah. I had a personal conversation with Bill Gothard about this whole issue of, okay, this particular epistle is written to the Jews. Yes. So, how does it apply to me? And so, as the typical dispensationalist, which he was at one time, well, let's see, I can't really take the Sermon on the Mount because that was the kingdom, and I can't really take this. And pretty soon he says, I'm a man without a Bible. You know, mm-hmm. going to all these other people. Yeah. So how do you respond to something like that when you have epistles written to a specific people yeah. but it also applies to us? Right. In what sense? Okay, so basically it was written to the Jews. How does it apply to me as a Gentile? That's the question. Yeah. Uh, the principle that I, I'm actually getting to, the principle that I keep seeing in the New Testament is to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. All right. So, we are grafted in. It's not we who support the, the tree, but it's the tree who supports us. Okay, So, that's really, really important. It's, it's God's election of Israel, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their descendants, that He would give the kingdom to them. And now, as Gentiles, we get the privilege of coming into this. And what's happened is, the Gentile church has turned it on its head, making it all about the Gentile church. And then God maybe has some, you know, something he's still going to do for the Jews. Okay. And somehow they're brought in. No, it's not that they're brought into the the party. They are the party. Okay. And we have the privilege of coming into it. We get to be grafted in. Now, some of them have been lopped off, but hey, look at the severity of God, right? If he can lop off the natural branches, he can also, and put in wild ones, he can also put the, the natural ones back in. So, again, it, it's not the Gentile church that supports the Jews. And, and I don't, I'm not talking about, you know, that every Jew that's ever lived is, you know, they're not, I'm not saying they're saved, okay? There, there's certainly something to this, but as far as it pertains to the kingdom, which is what our class is all about, the messianic age, the kingdom age, the... It's about the Jews. It's Jewish centric. And we as non Jews uh, have been invited to come and take part in that. So, you know, the book of first Peter, second Peter being written to the Jews, yeah. But what what common ground do we have? Ethnically? No, none. But what do we all believe in? We believe in Jesus, right? So though the message was to them, I mean I'm reading their mail, right? I mean, I can make the same argument. What, what does the, the letter to the Ephesians have in common with me? I wasn't living back then. I wasn't uh, going through what they're going through necessarily. But we're all believers in Jesus. And so we do share a common experience. So, uh, you know, I, mean, I, I, would, I would say that it's important who it's being written to, that we understand that. And, you know, we are reading their mail. But because we have a relationship in, in the Lord Jesus, because we've been grafted in, now uh, maybe not everything that was given to them specifically as Jews may or may not apply to me. Chances are most of it applies to me as well, because again I'm grafted in. But it's it's the whole uh, the horse and the cart thing, you know, which is coming first. And I think we're trying to put the cart in front of the horse, and I think it should be the other way around. Yeah. Yeah, um, there, there's a there's a much bigger issue 
when you look at the, the Bible as a whole, uh, you've got. See, how should I? How should I do this? Uh, you know, you've got the whole creation event. Things are good, and you've got the fall. Okay, and then we kind of have this six thousand year trough, and then we basically get up to sort of our baseline again, if you will, and. And this is what I would, you know, the millennium starts right here. We're, we're kind of back to, we're, we're basically back to square one, if you will. Okay? We'll work out some of those details as the class goes on. But it's, it's in this area that we're reading in the, in most of the pages of the Bible are taking place in this trough of this 6,000 years where we have things like sin, corruption, uh, not only of our moral self, but of our physical self, of the physical earth. All of that is inherent in that time. And so it's the question is, how do we get out of this ditch? That's the bigger question in the Bible. Yeah. Could you find something besides red to write with? I can't see it on the camera. <laughs> I'll try. Yeah. Let's try blue. So we're trying to get out of this, this ditch here of... of uh, you know, of this, this pit that we're in of sin and corruption and death. How do we get out of that? Well, we all know that, you know, the bigger story is about the, the seed of the woman that would come, the Lord Jesus, and then, of course, His work on the cross, and then finally taking the kingdom away from Satan and, and giving it back to, uh, you know, those who believe in Him, and, of course, Him reigning over that. So... Uh, when, when the seed of the woman uh, you might think of it like this you've got these concentric circles here's the big one the seed of the woman then we know it's going to come through uh, Seth then it's going to come through Noah then it's coming through Shem right then through Abraham and through Isaac and Jacob and David until finally we get down to the Messiah. That is the bigger context of the Bible. So one of the things that the Jewish people were chosen, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were chosen not because they were such incredible saints. And go back and look at the history. Did you read about these guys? Levi and Simon. They went and they killed a whole village in Shechem. These were dirty dudes, you know. I mean, they were not very nice at all. And so why did God choose these guys? I mean, what's up with that? Well, it wasn't because of their incredible righteousness. Moses keeps telling him, listen, God, don't think that God chose you because you're so wonderful and righteous and that he's giving you the land because you deserve it. No, 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 no. It's because these guys over here are so wicked that God is kicking them out and he's giving it to you. So it was nothing about their inherent goodness. But God had chosen, He had made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that through their seed would come the Messiah. That's the bigger story. And along the way, He, he blessed them and He gave them the books of the Bible and all this stuff. And so now because they were chosen to be the, the recipient of the seed, they got these other fringe benefits, you might say, the prophets and all this and, and all these blessings that sometimes they don't want and all that, right? So that's really the bigger story. It's about the seed of the Messiah. The seed of the woman finally comes through Mary and then Messiah is born and does his thing and all that. And so, and so those that were, were told, listen, the Messiah is coming. He's going to come through you guys. There's going to be this kingdom. You're invited. Here's your invitation. Come. Right? Some of them will be there and some of them won't. And now we've also been invited to come to the party. Come on, everybody come to the party. Because now it's going to happen. Yeah. Another, way, another thing that might bring you some comfort on the question that you asked, Claudio, is uh, the entire first resurrection includes more than just the Christ. The, the church mm. in Israel mm. uh, it's true that there's an emphasis on uh, Peter for it being 
uh, Israel. It's true that, in, as you were referring a while ago to uh, Romans 11, when we go through the grafting and the regrafting, we're still concentrating on Israel and the church. But there are other places that concentrate on the entire first resurrection. Mm. There's about five groups in the first resurrection. Okay. The Old Testament saints, the tribulation saints, uh-huh. the martyred ones, and the ones that are brought all the way through. But they can't always all be in every chapter. So, uh-huh. Yes. So all we've done is we've taken a slice here. Yes. The emphasis. Yeah. But that doesn't mean we have an excuse to say uh, to get out of this whole thing. We have to use the whole Bible. Right. In fact, I even did a nice. Uh, uh, which I'm going to show you later on about what I think is happening with some of the Muslim countries. Mm. Which ones of them are going to have what kind of action during the 1,000 years? Interesting. And they're going to be busy. Uh huh. So and, yeah. And who's the Antichrist chasing some of the time when he's chasing down to Africa? Uh-huh. Someone is not cooperating. And that's where the Muslims <laughs> are. Right so. Someone's not cooperating. So, yeah. I think we have a yeah. big group that we're going to be yeah. going to see. Yeah. In the first resurrection. Yeah. Well, and, and this goes back to that concept of triangulation that I was sharing with you. Is is that we've got to look at, and it's a big task, but we have to look at the Bible as a whole and take the different verses, and that's how we're going to be able to pinpoint our position. So that when we look at the issue of the, the resurrection, and we look at you know the, the bigger picture, we can we can draw this thing because we've looked at the entire Bible. You know, I mean, there's not one verse that, that gives you this sort of chart, you know. But if you look at the entire Bible, you'll see something like this kind of picture emerge. And, and so that's why we have to we have to look at everything. And it is a big task because there's a lot of 31,000 verses in the Bible, and they take time to read and they take time to to just you know meditate on them and to kind of make them a part of you. But uh, once we do that, then we can begin to see. Uh, some exciting things. So, all right. So, anyway, Peter. Uh, lastly, we must acknowledge two important points. Peter was the apostle to the Jews. In Galatians two seven through nine, Paul states that he was entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter was to the circumcised. Second, Babylon was the third largest Jewish center in the ancient world when the Jews were given leave under Cyrus to return to Israel in 536 B.C., only a small remnant returned while many thousands stayed in Babylon. The writing of the Babylonian Talmud gives concrete proof to the fact that Babylon was a major center of Jewish life and culture. Since Peter was the apostle specifically appointed to take the gospel to the Jews, and then finding him in Babylon, not Rome, incidentally, in the company of Jews is simple enough to grasp. Whether or not Peter ever ventured to Rome as church history would have us believe is therefore a question, though it's outside of the scope of this brief study. Nevertheless, we see that Peter is writing from Babylon in the company of other Jews, the chosen, to fellow chosen ones who were also in the diaspora that is not living in Israel. Realizing that Peter is the apostle to the elect, the Jews, and is writing from Babylon to the other elect Jews facilitates the interpretation of the two epistles. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter writes concerning his Jewish believing brethren, You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But you are a chosen generation. And note there, the word is genos and not genea. So genos refers to a race and not to a generation. No, it's, it's talking about an ethnicity. Uh, the NASB has, uh, or, anyway, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We find the same words in the Old Testament. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Exodus 19.5. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Exodus 19.6. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. So you see how, again, these are the promises already given to the Jewish people. They're not specifically given to us as Gentiles, but insofar as we are grafted in, we have some type of a role. And I suppose God can work that out in the end. But uh, uh, we see that again in... 
Deuteronomy 14.2 and uh, Psalm 135.4. And then he goes on and he speaks to the Jewish pilgrims. You were... You once were not a people, but now you are God's people. You are shown you were shown no mercy, but now you have received mercy. The passage is taken from Hosea one nine, where God speaking to Israel states, Then the Lord said, Name him not my people, Loami, because you are not my people, and I am not your God. Peter is demonstrating that their previous condition has been undone in Jesus Christ. This truth is given by God through Hosea. However, in the future the number of people of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which can neither be measured nor numbered. Although it was said to them, you are not my people, it was said to them, you are children of the living God. So, um, they're, they're elected, but they're not necessarily saved. Now, obviously the ones in Peter are saved, because he's writing to, he's writing to believers. But uh, again, our, our first uh, thesis here, election does not mean salvation. Thus, when we read in Second Peter, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. We know that Peter is talking to Jews and that their election has nothing to do with salvation. Therefore, it is not a Calvinistic call for us to somehow make sure that we have been chosen to eternal life. It is rather a reminder of the chosen people to embrace the fact that they were elected, chosen by God to be a special treasure. However, their election by no means is an absolute guarantee that they will inherit eternal life. Uh, in Second Timothy, Paul says, Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Jesus Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Uh, so Paul is enduring for the elect, the Jews, so that they too might be saved. And uh, then we read in Romans 11, where Paul, who is speaking about the Jews, states, Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. And then uh, in, the, in the book of Romans, elect in the book of Romans, part of the challenge of understanding Romans is to recognize that Paul is speaking to the believers in Rome who are both Jewish and Gentile, not non-Jewish, that is. We learn that from the way he addresses his readers. The gospel of Christ is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So the Jew and Greek is a combination that he uses throughout the book. See, for example, Romans 2, 9, 10, 10, 12, and uh, Romans 2, 17, Paul speaks specifically to the Jews. Indeed, you are called a Jew. Uh, and the rest and rest on the law and make your boast in God. Paul then asks what advantage the Jew has. And he answers his question with much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. In chapter 4, Paul speaks of Abraham, who was their father according to the flesh. Adam, Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh. Thus, Paul was essentially describing Abraham as our genetic birth father. The Net Bible confirms this translation. Abraham, our ancestor according to the flesh, Finally, Paul bridges the apparent polemic between the Jews and Greeks of the Roman church with the following conclusion. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is over all is rich to all who call upon him. So again, it's not that one has the advantage in, in as far as salvation goes. We're all going to be made the, the same as far as our salvation. You have a you have a wedding garment on or don't you? Right? Who cares if you're of the the many that are called? Or you're about the few that are chosen. Do you have a wedding garment? And the wedding garment is given through Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter if you're a man, you're a woman. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or you're a Gentile. Got to have the wedding garment. No wedding garment? Not coming in here. All right? So, having seen that the book of Romans was written in large part to the Jews, um as well as Gentiles, we can now see that many uses of the word elect are not references to salvation, predestination, etc. Rather, they are references to the Israelites, elected by God, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving, the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came. Therefore, Paul's question, who shall bring a charge against God's elect, is not Cal uh, Calvinistic predestined to eternal life, but is a reference to the elect Jews. And this concept is used throughout the book. So uh, let me uh, skip down here to election of grace. Paul continues in Romans 11, Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. This was spoken of the encounter of Elijah and the 400 prophets of Baal. Just when Elijah thought all was lost, God informed him that he had reserved 7,000 who had not followed the evil ways of Baal. And thus, in like manner, most of Israel who had been chosen, elected by God to be the conduit of blessing to the world, had rejected that special calling. 
This concords with what Jesus stated in Matthew 22, 14, that the few, the Jews, are chosen, and that small group had for the most part rejected the special RSVP that God had sent to them to come to the wedding feast. Paul continues, What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. It must be noted that the word elect here is in fact feminine singular, demonstrating that it is not speaking of the elect ones, which is masculine, plural, eclectu, but election. This means that in both Romans 11, 5 and 7, the term election, thus God's active action of selecting Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be the recipients of the promises, um, and the entire context of the elect and the election has to do with Israel as evidenced by Paul's following statement of how they, the Jews, have not stumbled so as to fall. On the contrary, because of their stumbling, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make the Jews jealous. The biblical election of grace is not Calvin's idea of God choosing some to eternal life and others to eternal damnation. It is rather God choosing the Jewish race, which was based purely on God's grace and not on their righteousness. Moses plainly states that early in their national history, it's not because of your righteousness, etc., which we've talked about, that the election of grace is referring to God's choosing of the fathers is further established in chapter 11. Now, if their stumbling means riches to the world and if their fall means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Israel, nationally speaking, rejected the invitation to come to the wedding feast when the bridegroom came, which thereby translated into riches for the Gentiles. However, the election of grace, that is God's making promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their seed, was an irrevocable call by which Paul says about the unbelieving Jews, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. I just want you guys to go ahead and finish reading that uh, when you get home. And uh, we're not done with today, but I just want to uh, look at a few more things. Uh, next week, incidentally, we're going to talk about the fall feasts prophetically fulfilled. And I think you'll enjoy that. 